Uh, Michael O'Brien is a longtime uh, photographer, photojournalist whose career has spanned over four decades. Um, three amazing books that he has done, Face of Texas, and then I guess the Face of Texas Redux, Redo? They, yeah, it, had a re <laughs> it was reborn. Reborn. Uh, and I'll mention Hard Ground also, really an amazing book of photographs. Um, his photographs are collected all over the country, including a huge collection here at the Whitlock Collections. Uh, Michael sent a couple of photos, so Lida, can we transition to those? I've got the clicker. Which way do I point the clicker? <laughs> I point them at Lida. Okay, so the photographers you can see, maybe. There we good, go. Good, good, okay. All right, so now you know what you're talking about. Yeah, so wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me, and I'm gonna to try to talk in the microphone and <laughs> make myself loud. And uh, I, my story is I went, to, I went to college at the University of Tennessee, the other UT in Knoxville, and worked as a staff photographer as a student newspaper, majored in philosophy, and while I was at the newspaper, I fell in love with photography, and I wanted to be a staff photographer for a newspaper. My first job out of college was working for the afternoon newspaper in Miami, in Miami called the Miami News. And so there's a hierarchy. I was the new guy hired, so I got the worst assignments. And one of the worst assignments you could possibly get is to photograph the officer of the week. <laughs> and, uh, so in, in this picture, this is, uh, this is what happened. There's a story behind it, which David, David asked for. So I was a low man on the totem pole. I went out to 17th Avenue, 36th Street, to photograph the officer week, Vernon Heatherton, 1975. While I was taking this picture and just trying to get the neighborhood that he worked in in the background, we heard what I thought were firecrackers going off about a block away but it was really an armed robbery happening. And a guy had gone into a dentist office, gunmen had come in and locked the guy and the dentist in the closet and taken all the money. But the guy, the dental patient, had a gun in his glove compartment. <laughs> of course, th this is, Not even <laughs> this Texas. isn't Texas, this is just Florida. Uh, and was irate that he had been uh, robbed while he's having his tooth fixed. Very, you know, very, you know, you get your tooth fixed, you just want to get the filling in, and, and the guy takes all your money. So he went to his glove compartment, got his car, and started running down the street shooting at this Plymouth Valiant. Somehow the officer who had his back turned to this Vernon Heatherton had figured, figured all this out. And and shot into the car as it was going around the corner, grazed the, the driver and his, uh, assa his, uh, his victim and his accomplice, yeah. And the car crashes. And this little, the thing I love about it is the girl in the roller skates. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's, it's it's a documentary photo uh, photograph, you know, it's, it's a, a moment that actually happened, but it's surreal with the arms of the guy that's been shot saying, no more, no more, the girl skating by. And uh, I think that's why I fell in love with photography because the real world is just so fascinating. All, everything that's happening and the fact that you can take a camera and record it. And I love watching, you know, I love watching people, what they do, and anticipating what's gonna happen and being in the right place. So, you know, I got out of philosophy. I wasn't good at the mind-body problem. No one solved it yet. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, the other thing about it is I thought philosophy, all you did is you, the, the professor came in at the beginning of the quarter and said, what is truth? And by the end of the quarter, everybody was still tracing chasing their tail. And I love the fact you could click a camera, develop the film, put in a larger, making something material, and said, I did something today. Nice. 
<clears throat> Next image? Yeah. How am I on time? <laughs> You're doing great, Michael. <laughs> so uh, this is from 1993. It was on assignment for Texas Monthly. And I made my livelihood was working for the print media. And there was a wonderful art director, DJ Stout, and his job was really to match up the photographer with the right subject matter. And so this was to take a picture of Harvey Pinnock, the legendary golf instructor, and the co-writer of his book, Bud Schrake, who was a, a, a big friend of, of Bill Whitliff's. And um, so I always think like going into a photographic assignment is like going into a boxing match, that you, you got to survive by your wits. And the idea is you, you got to coax a little bit more time out of the subjects, and you got to get cooperation. So it's, it's sort of a give and take, but I, I love that part of it. So we did it at the Austin Country Club, and it's in celebration of the Little Red Book of Golf, which became one of the best-selling books ever, ever. And Bud showed up in this drab, sort of gray uh, sweatshirt, and surviving on my wits and not having a wardrobe stylist and stuff like that, I say, where can I get clothes? Because he needs clothes. I go into the pro shop and I know I have, I'm dealing with green, I'm gonna deal with blue, the sky blue, the grass green, and I find the brightest red sweater I can. And I get it, and here's, here's sort of the boxing match. I bring it out to Bud and said, I think we need to change, you know, this color palette and everything like that. And I show it to him. And he looks at it. He said, Michael, I'd never wear anything like that. <laughs> he said, aren't you a documentary photographer? <laughs> well, I said, on Monday and Tuesdays I am, but on Wednesdays, <laughs> I'm a photographer with artistic license. <laughs> so I said, you know, Bud, you know this game, if you blow your photograph, if I blow the photograph, you blow the story, our employment goes down. <laughs> so can you help this poor photographer? And he said, oh, I just hate it. I said, but help me, it's gonna be, it's gonna be better, they'll make the picture bigger. You wanna be a little square like a postage stamp or you wanna be really big? The, the ego thing helps, and, uh, and so he put it on, and the photograph came out, and I, I love the picture, and a backstory, uh, Bill Whitliff got this put into the National Portrait Gallery. It was the first picture of mine. So that was a wonderful ending to the story, but there's more. <laughs> it's Keep short. <laughs> Bud Schrag dated Ann Richards, and they were going out, and it's just right after this picture had come out in Texas Monthly. And so they're going out, and Bud was dressed and everything. And she turns to Bud, and she says, you know, I got a little bone to pick with you, Bud. And he said, what? And she says, you know, you really don't dress that nice when you take me out. <laughs> and I saw that beautiful red sweater that you have <laughs> in Texas Monthly. <laughs> so how about it for next time? <laughs> if this panel is a boxing match, you just landed a really good blow there, Michael. That's great. Okay, Keith, are you no, ready? I'm not going to follow that. <laughs> you can go to Kate. No. <laughs> Michael. Keith Carter is a him. distinguished artist, educator, musician, holds the endowed Wallace Chair of Art at Lamar University. His work has been shown in over 100 uh, solo exhibitions in 13 countries, author of 11 books, including the most recent, at least I think it's still the most recent, Keith Carter, 50 Years, done with us, uh, 
and we're very, very proud to have the biggest damn collection of Keith Carter photographs anywhere in the world is here <laughs> at the Whitliff Collections. <laughs> Take it away, Keith. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I grew up in a, a, a single parent uh, household and uh, my mother was the uh, breadwinner, so to speak, and she was a photographer of children. So I grew up around it. And uh, when I got out of uh, college, I was a, a, a business major and, and not particularly f well focused. And I borrowed her camera and I was 21 at that point. And uh, I made some photographs of some uh, fellas fishing down on the Natchez River. And I had them processed, and I went back, and I showed my mom. And my mom said, honey, you have a good eye. You have a nice sense of light. That's the truth. It was just good parenting. So uh, I uh, bought my own camera, and I took the Greyhound bus to New York City. And I know how hillbilly that sounds, but back then, that was the least expensive way to get to New York City. And I had written the Museum of Modern Art. John Zarkowski, and I said, I'm a, a serious photographer, and could I visit your collection? And they wrote, some intern wrote back, a very nice intern, and said, could you be more specific who you'd like to see? So I knew about three or four people, Ansel Adams being one of them. <laughs> and I took the Greyhound bus. It was the least expensive way. It went through nine cities, and I got there in not quite three days. I got, it's February, I got off the bus, uh, it's before we have rolling luggage, and I had my little suitcase, and I turned right out of the bus station, and I passed a, it's snowing, and I passed a, a heavyset fella in a shabby overcoat with a baby carriage and a big fat cat on the baby carriage, <laughs> and he had a chalkboard around his neck that looks like a, a restaurant sign, and it said, Poems, one dollar. <laughs> Well, my dollars were precious, and I walked right by him, and then I thought, you know, that's bad karma, man. Go back. And I turned around, and I gave him a dollar, and I bought the number one poem on his list. And I swear to you, the number one poem was entitled, Rock Your Ass Off. <laughs> <laughs> I kid you not. And it consisted of him shouting at the top of his voice at various cadences, Rock your ass off, rock your ass off, rock your ass off. <laughs> it was kind of musical, and I was just fascinated. Nobody else on the uh, avenue was paying the least bit of attention to him, and the cat slept through the whole thing. <laughs> anyway, uh, I go to the Museum of Art, and Art, and I could go up three days a week. I only had enough money for two weeks. I went up three days a week for four hours a day, and their in in interns were so nice to me, and they brought me people I needed to see, and so on and so forth. And I took the bus back through nine states, and going back, I kept thinking to myself, okay, buddy, this is what you really want to do. You're just going to go back, and you're just going to rock your ass off. <laughs> Think of it as sort of a poetic metaphor. And, uh, anyway, so it's been a wonderful uh, uh, couple, uh, or more than a couple decades, and I have some wonderful uh, colleagues. I wanted to show you two photographs. Uh, the, uh, f the kind of work that I do primarily is black and white, uh, and I work on projects, and I give myself generally two to three years to finish a project. And a project generally consists of about 80 to 90 photographs. I think in, in terms of large bodies, uh, of work. But two years ago, I got a, a phone call from a, a nonprofit in uh, Chicago that was a children's advocacy group. And uh, they, it was at the time when uh, a former administration was uh, separating uh, uh, children from their parents on the border. And they asked me if I'd go to the border, the Texas border, near a little north of El Paso. And uh, uh, photograph for four days. And I said, yes, I'll go. And, uh, and I went, and I, I did that. And I'd like to show you this first photograph. Uh, the day I got there, there was a dust storm. And if you've never seen the border wall, uh, this is outside of the things I normally do, um, it's like something out of a science fiction movie. It's 
imposing, it's tall, it goes on forever, and it's black, just black in the desert. And that part of the desert was just like a, a lunar landscape. So uh, the, the, that was the first photograph I made during that four-day uh, sojourn. I'd like to go to the next one now, please. And on the fourth day, uh, I had about a 10.30 flight from El Paso back to uh, Houston. And I got up at, uh, right before dawn, and I walked over. I wasn't staying far from the wall itself. And I walked over to the wall, and uh, I turned, uh, helicopters are going over because they're looking for migrants and so on and so forth. And I turned left, um, and I started walking. I went about a mile, and um, the wind's blowing, all this kind of stuff. And I pass a little culvert with a, a metal balustrade beside it. And it's the only sort of landmark there was at all in that topography at all. And as I walked by it, I saw a little flap, what looked to be a little flap sticking out of the earth. And I went over to examine it, and it was a piece of uh, plastic fabric. And I dug down a little bit, and to make a long story short, I dug up a pack, a little day pack. It looked like a children's day pack and it was like a faux designer day pack. Um, and I can't really uh, do this justice, but I wrestled with my conscience. I didn't know quite what to do. I'm all by myself, and the wind's blowing, and blah, 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 blah. Sun's coming up. And I decided to open it, and that's what I found. And then I decided to take everything out. These were big social conscious decisions on my part in that Moment, those few moments, to take everything out and lay it against that cement culvert and make uh, a photograph of the contents of the pack. So that's what you're looking at there. And let me see if I can find it. And I wanted to tell you that there was one red blanket, pretty threadbare. There was some kind of energy bar. That's the top right. There was uh, a Gatorade kind of drink. Then there was some cookies, and then there was another energy drink, and then there were some chips and some pretzels and some Doritos and another orange drink and one red apple. And I photographed all of them. And then I went back, and I, uh, uh, before I caught my uh, taxi to the airport, I went over and found a border guard, and I said, uh, what? I, I, I found something here, and I showed him what was on the digital camera. I said, what, what, what was I looking at? And he said, uh, well, what that probably was somebody on our side, the North American side, had uh, taken a known landmark and put a uh, small uh, pack for if a migrant got across, mm. they would know to go there and dig that up, and that could get them through the desert for maybe two days. Um, and he said, what did you do with it? And I said, well, I didn't know what to do with it. I just put it all back and reburied it. I just didn't know what I was looking at. And he said, well, somebody will probably dig that up, and blah, 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 blah. And I can't tell you, but I want to tell you how that affected me. And if it was you, I'm pretty sure it affects you the same way. Part of it's the topography. Part of it's the circumstances. Part of it's the physicality of it. And I dwell in the art world. And I'm thinking, you know, this is like the, uh, a conceptual art project that somebody did to save somebody else's life. So um, that's what I wanted to show you. And that's what I wanted to tell you. Thank you. Well, I'm not following that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to have to. <laughs> Unless you just want to leave. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're not going to let Kate leave. Kate Brakey, um, visual artist, most known for uh, hand coloring photographs, just giant photographs we have. And we actually have 
works by each of these photographers. It's kind of a where's Waldo hunt for you guys. Somewhere in these galleries, we have at least one photograph of each of these, by each of these photographers. Um, Kate's work has appeared in more than 75 solo exhibitions. That's old. <laughs> Excuse me. Who are you calling old? <laughs> 120 now, nearly as much as Keith did. Whoa. No competition, right? <laughs> uh, and shown, I'll just say, all over the world. How about that? No, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> Is it warm in here? Did I ask that before? I think I did ask that before. All right, Kate. All right. I'm going to let you go. Let me give you can have the clicker. Please hand the clicker which, down to Kate. Which, um, and just click right and point it right at Lida. Uh, click right for. Okay. All right. So it? this isn't going to be funny at all. This is like extremely sobering. I was actually just going to tell you a couple of the big projects that I've done this year. Um, I actually been. I feel like I've been incredibly productive during COVID because there was kind of nothing else to do but <laughs> spend time in my studio making artwork. But I got. Uh, a couple of shows that had been um, postponed um, that I finally got to put up and then finally got to go out to as things were calming down. Um, but the, big, the first one was a show that I got invited to be in in Atlanta, in a small art museum outside of Atlanta, and it was called Three Billion, and it was curated by this uh, woman who, in association with the Audubon Society of Atlanta, um, uh, on the news that, in fact, there's just this absolutely terrible thing happening at the moment, we've, uh, some of you probably know that there's research that suggests that we've lost three billion birds in the last 50 years just out of the North American um, ecosystem. And it's looking bad. And um, she asked whether I would, she knows that I do work that's about the natural world. I'm sorry, I've got to remember to do this. Um, and that I photograph birds. I'm the bird lady. so. Um, <laughs> She said, would I do something? And I realized that um, I had, out of this huge series of uh, photograms that the collection owns, um, I had at least 60 birds, all shapes and sizes, and uh, from very large birds, hawks and owls, right through to tiny hummingbirds. And so I said, yes, I'd like to be in the show. And um, I put all the photograms together in this giant shape um, and called it Flock. And there was writing that went with all of this about the, the whole notion that uh, birds are all, as I said, um, not well. It's it's a very sobering thing that you know this is an indicator that uh, we're in trouble. That basically, and it's everything. It's habitat. Um, uh, you know what I'm saying? Hab the loss of their habitat and the fact that they climate change and all of the extreme weather um, things going on, like happened here. Um, Pesticides, um, domestic cats, they fly into uh, buildings and uh, anyway, so that the, it's just this horrible sobering um, signal that what we've done to the planet, um, you know, spells immeasurable trouble uh, for them, but also for the health of our entire planet and therefore our well-being. I guess, you know, we can't imagine a world without birds, basically, but that's what we've sort of headed towards. Anyway, there's all, I mean, again, I don't want to get too, uh, too depressing here. There are things we can do about this and, and I won't talk about that. But um, the other big project I did for this particular show, um, the Three Billion show, uh, were a whole series, is it that way around? It's this way, uh, of right. birds that the Audubon, I got in touch with the Audubon and they were sending me dead birds because they collect birds for research. and. Um, they were sending me dead birds on ice because that, they know that that's what I do. And I was making pictures of them um, as if they were sort of scientific drawings. And again, there was a lot of writing that went with this. But um, it was a fantastic show and, and hopefully very educational. They, this particular institution had a lot of people through and there was a lot of material to read about what we can do f to prevent this thing, this loss. Um, and so anyway, this, this is now a big, big series, and I continue to do them. This is a mockingbird. I didn't tell you what they were. The last one was a Puriloxia, and they're native to the desert. And uh, there was a mourning dove, and I think the first one was a little white-crowned sparrow. Anyway, so um, I went out there, and we all spoke about the, 
the projects and the work being done in various uh, organisations about all of this. So then the next thing I did, which is completely different, uh, was a collaboration between um, my young assistant uh, and I. He had, we both realised we had an interest in uh, astronomy and um, we both had big long lenses and we'd been photographing, you know, the moon and so forth. But this project was quite something. I found out that you can go online to itelescope.net and you can pay some money and you can actually use remote telescopes um, um, that are for the public in four different uh, observatories around the world. This one was Siding Springs, Australia, because the Australian skies, I might say, are much nicer than the <laughs> Northern Hemisphere skies. There's lots of beautiful things and, of course, it's very dark. Anyway, so we, we did this and we learned how to do it. It was a bit of a, a learning curve. Um, but and we just I just thought it was so... Um, conceptually poetic to, to instruct a telescope on the other side of the world to point at an object on the other side of the universe and collect that ancient light, light light years away, 13,000 light years, 25 million light years. I mean, we, we did a whole series of images um, and basically send us, you know, pixels and we downloaded it and printed it. So anyway, that was fantastic. I found it, again, during this weird, sad time, just kind of contemplating that the space and the time and the technology, it was just transforming and sort of a little bit uplifting. Um, that last one was a globular cluster that is 13,000 light years away. This one is called the Sombrero Galaxy, which is 29 million light years away. This one is the Tarantula Nebula, one of my favourites, which is 159,000 light years away. And the last one is the Spiral Galaxy, uh, beautiful spiral galaxy called M. M100, a very romantic name. This is 55 million years, light years away. Um, and so then we, ha we printed them all mm -hmm. in digitally. We toned them sort of slightly different, nice sky colours, and then put them on the wall of this show called The Sky, which I was in Phoenix earlier this year. We, there was also more work than this. I did an installation that was called um, 50 Little Pictures of Big Skies. I went back through and I, I picked all my nice sky pictures and um, printed them up and framed them because I'm completely insane and did this installation. But it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, so then, I, I, so the other thing I do is I've been photographing the moon rather a lot. I'm very lucky. I live outside of the city of Tucson in the desert. And this is from my front porch mm. with... Um, with a 400 millimeter big old glass lens. And um, I just wait for the times when the moon is setting over this peak that I look at in the front yard and um, you know get these beautiful shots. And now I've got enough um, same peak. So you know different phases of the moon, slightly different times in the night um, and different um, different places on the peak, obviously. So I now have a whole series of these that I've put together with a, a, a friend of mine who's a poet, and she's written poems about the moon. And there's a big series called Moon Song that I'm trying to get a folio together with uh, my good friend Jace Graff, who's a box maker, folio, book maker, book binder, folio maker. Most lots of you all know him. We've all done projects with Jace. He's amazing. <laughs> And um, so, and again, it's been, I just think of all those poor people sequestered in their New York City apartments, and there I am standing on my front porch, you know, feeling kind of lonely and miserable, but at least I've got the moon and the sky and the stars <laughs> and the mountains. So it hasn't been that bad. And then I guess finally I'm just going to plug um, the fact that I've got an exhibition at the moment in, um, in Austin at the Stephen L. Clark Gallery. And... Um, it's new work, 45 pieces, mostly of new work. So if you're up there, please go and see. It opened last night, but it's on sort of indefinitely. But um, this is an image that's my new favorite image, uh, this raven that was given to me by a rancher. And he found it. It's a big, it's called a common raven. They're the very big ones, and they're very common in Arizona. And um, uh, it was beautiful. It was, I became sort of obsessed. I photographed it for two or three days straight in all different ways. and. Uh, I started reading about ravens, and of course they're fantastically fascinating creatures. They're incredibly smart. Um, they use tools. They uh, they are in mythology. They are um, represented as uh, in every every culture of the world of mythology. They are um, tricksters and shapeshifters and um, bringers. Uh, you know. 
prophets, all sorts of things, fascinating. And also what I read, which was rather beautiful, is that they mate for life. And um, when they lose their partner, they actually mourn for two years before they go find themselves an, a new partner. And I just thought it was so sad when I was photographing this, I just thought, you know, this is a memorial to the fact that its mate is mourning for it. Anyway, so that's, that's it for me. Nothing funny. <laughs> I'm sorry, but um, <laughs> hopefully Avery Cathy can tell you some jokes. <laughs> So there'll be a there's a blank one next, Kathy. If, and if you want to advance your own, that's that's great. So it's uh, at once. So, it's blank. so Kathy Vargas, uh, currently professor of art and photography at University of the Incarnate Word, San Antonio. Um, she has shown everywhere, including retrospectives, uh, a little locally at the McNay Art Museum in San Antonio. Uh, and I'm not going to pronounce the institution because I cannot, uh, but a very fine institution in Germany uh, as well. Um, and reading through her bio, there's a couple facts I would highlight. One, she was named in 2005 Texas Two-Dimensional Artist of the Year by the Texas Commission of the Arts, and that her papers are housed at the Smithsonian Archives of American Art, one of the great uh, archives anywhere, uh, and we know archives here at the Whitliff, and they are amazing in terms of what they collect for, for artists. Uh, so, Kathy, talk to us. Okay. Um, I wanted to talk about some of the pieces that are in the Whitliff collection, uh, and this is one of the first pieces that Bill and Connie chose. Uh, I wanted to tell you about the origins, because it has a lot to do with how I've evolved as an artist. Uh, this piece was uh, originated in about 1986 or so, after I too made my pilgrimage to New York, just, just as Keith did. <laughs> These are the things we did as young artists. We made our pilgrimages to New York, and I took my portfolio to show to a man by the name of Ivan Karp, who owned O.K. Harris Gallery. And I told him I'd been making images of the ecology uh, and showed him my fish and frogs. And he offhandedly said, we eat frogs' legs for lunch here. And that gave me the idea for this image. <laughs> Mr. Carp was a powerful man in the art world. And after going through my photos, he said, I'm going to send you to an agent, a friend of mine, but don't show her the seafood. Show her the flowers only. The flower photos were remembrances for friends who died of AIDS, but Mr. Karp didn't know that. He found them pretty. My work is often found pretty, but that's just a way of getting people to look. The dancing frogs, these guys, are humorous, but the piece is about dancing as fast as you can, thinking you're dictating the tune, and trying not to notice that your hands are nailed to your instrument. These musicians are playing dollar signs, not musical notes. When Bill saw these, and he was also a powerful man, he had no problem with what the work had to say. He never said, show me the pretty stuff only. He was smarter. He respected artists because he was a creator himself. The art world is complicated, especially for people who tend to speak their minds. And in the late 1990s, I made this piece. It was an image of my mother as she lay dying, made with her permission. I asked her if I could take pictures of her. She knew she was passing away. She said, do whatever you need to do to understand this. She was a very religious woman, which is why the cross. She never question the pain she was undergoing. She accepted her physical suffering as a down payment on eternity. While the piece is a tribute to her, it's also a spiritual questioning. Why does God want your pain, Mom? What's he going to do with it? In the late 90s, the age of censorship, religious content was not something a lot of collections wanted to deal with. 
but Bill had specifically asked that I bring this set of photos for purchase. This piece was made as a response to US intervention in Latin America. The woman in the photo looks like me. We're both indigenous, but an accident of birth safely located me in the United States. She was looking for the father of her child who'd gone missing. Did he abandon her? A Guatemalan friend explained, more likely he was disappeared by your government. The text in this image asked, did my tax dollars do that? The Whitliff owns this piece because it was gifted to them by Pick Swartz. He was a good friend, and when he was downsizing, he asked if I'd mind his giving this piece to the Whitliff. And I said, that's the perfect place for it. The Whitliff is fearless. Bill must have written it into the job description because it describes everyone who works here, everybody I know. When a collection adds an artist's work, it's like entering into a marriage. Love, honor, and cherish. It's a pledge made by both sides to work together in mutual respect and understanding. When the Whitliff collection buys my work, I feel at ease. It's been an easy relationship, which is why I'm slowly giving them my own photo collection. Photographers often trade images, and I have a pretty good set of images. This is a good place to plant a legacy. So thank you, Bill, for having the brilliant idea to create the Whitliff Collection. And thanks to all of you who support it, keep it going, and all of you who work here. Keep it fearless. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Wow. Body blow after body blow to keep the, the metaphor going. Um, thank you. Well, thank you all artists. That Those are amazing comments and amazing images. Um, I know I prepared a few questions and I shared some of those questions in advance. I think we probably have a few minutes where I can ask uh, maybe one or two of them. Um, and these questions are for, for all of you to address as you wish. You don't have to address it, of course. Um, but were there, uh, mentioning Bill makes me think of, you know, the, the phrase he liked to use about uh, young people may have um, the itch to create but not yet the courage. And so that element of courage, of course, that Kathy just kind of alluded to in her own way, um, is something that's very important for artists. And, and, but I know that you sometimes lose that courage. And I want to ask each of you, are there, are, have there been times, were there times when you questioned your path of being a creator? And I'm, I'm willing to take whichever one wants to go first. Let Would you us repeat know. that question? I can. <laughs> Were there times when you questioned your path of being a creator? And maybe of your chosen medium? Um, no, because it's the only thing I can actually do. <laughs> so, you know, I just do it. So, no. <laughs> Uh, I've never questioned my path. I've sometimes questioned how to get there. Yeah. Having gone to the New York art world and thinking, I don't want to make certain concessions. I realized that I was on a different path that I've been very happy with all my life. I've never uh, ever questioned uh, uh, the, the path. Um, it makes it makes me. And this is a selfish thing. It makes me feel alive in the world to make photographs, to pay attention to issues or objects or things or God bless you, people. I mean, no, I never have questioned it. I just feel lucky, fortunate. Um, what, while I was going to college, they didn't have any photographic, formal photographic classes, so. To learn, I, they had a collection of all the Life magazines in the library, and th 
those guys were my hero, the W. Eugene Smith, Davis, Douglas Duncan. These were the great documentary photographers, so I loved going through and looking at that work and, and, and learning from it. And I, I, I fell in love being able to document the human condition with the camera. And I, I thought it was amazing. And I never thought I would get to work at a little afternoon newspaper and then go into Life magazine and even like being on the 28th floor of the Time Life building where all these greats had walked before was just, oh, it was just, it, I, I pinched myself to say, am I really here? And in and, um, and the photography, I, I think I was introverted by nature, but the photography was a springboard into the world. And oh my gosh, I, all the things that I got to observe and document is just, is magical. Um, but it's been with the, I, I exist a little bit different than the rest because they're fi more fine art photographers. I existed in the print media business and every time you finished a job, you were unemployed. So, you know, <laughs> it, it was always, you know, talking Bud Shraken to get into the red sweater. But <laughs> <laughs> I guess just the last question, and this may sound a bit, I don't know, old man crotchety, but I'm just going to say it anyway. <laughs> Since you mentioned camera, it made me think of technology. What, with young people, young aspiring artists, uh, and especially with photography, uh, what do young people miss by having all of this ready technology at their fingertips in terms of creating images? I mean, we could talk about more generally later. <laughs> Um, but especially in terms of image making. Kathy, did you want to? Yes, because I just got through talking to my students about this. <laughs> when you think way back to the time of William Henry Jackson, who had the giant camera, who had to stop the expedition at the Grand Canyon to take his one or two pictures, who had to set up the giant camera, set up the dark tent, sensitize the plates, he had to be so careful to get that perfect shot in one take, or maybe two. Now, we've got memory cards. You've got 300 chances. So you don't think about it as much. My generation had 35 millimeter cameras, 36 exposures. You could carry 10 rolls of film in your pockets if you wanted to. That's a lot of chances to get something right. But now, it seems limitless. So we have a proliferation of photographs, but we don't think as hard when we shoot as we used to. We don't think about composition framing the absolute great moment. I think that that's too bad. Yeah, I, I second that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not an educator, so yeah, I, I don't have to deal with this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I agree with that also, uh, but if you look at, not but, and if you look at the history of photography, it's only about 179 years old, one process has always replaced another process from the very beginning. And what we're living through, and I personally am thankful for it, I think it's just amazing, is another evolution, you know. But what doesn't change is the human sensibilities and how we look at the culture we live in at this time. And uh, everything evolves from that. I, I think it's very exciting, you know. And I practice antiquarian processes. I love old processes. But I find the digital world miraculous, totally miraculous. They're both good. Um, I think that's a great, uh, it's a great question you pose. I mean, and I think that the the digitization of photography has democratized it and, and made everybody has the ability to make a photograph that's in focus and compose and everything. And really, uh, especially the, the panelists, everybody, what's in, I feel like their photographs are what exist inside them. And whether they had to use a film camera or a digital camera, they would find some way, they would be compelled to express their story and their narrative. Um, so it's, uh, it's sort of a, a hybrid thing. And uh, I, I, 
I think it's amazing in a news sense, so much footage on the news can come so from an iPhone camera and be so real with the video. And we're seeing things that we would never see. And that was what photojournalism was always about, except now a lot of it's done by civilians and non-professionals, which is fantastic. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.